everybody. Happy Monday. My name is Elise. Welcome to my tea table. Let's talk about dignified hospitality. This, as in all Mondays, I wear the most appropriate shirt. <laughs> um, I talk about a manifesto of how more dignity can be brought to our food system. That is everything from the farm, or in today's case, the ocean, uh, to the supply chain, um, to the restaurants, the cooks, the chefs, the servers. Hey Don, good to see you, happy Monday, thanks for stopping by. Uh, and even the consumer, even the, the diner of those restaurants, uh, how we can bring more dignity to all of their lives as they all contribute important value to our food supply chain. Hey Quincy, good to see you. Thanks for stopping by. I'm talking about sustainable fish. Now there was a very popular documentary uh, that did turn some heads and I would say I haven't watched the documentary myself, uh, but compared to other expose documentaries, I have heard the feedback from people that Seaspiracy uh, was far more influential in affecting people's future eating habits, consumer habits, when it came to, uh, to fish over documentaries that have come out regarding the fast food industry or the meat industry, because of course, uh, there are some major sustainability issues in all of those industries, just as I'm constantly talking about the sustainability issues of the tea industry, which you would think it's a plant, you know, what's so unsustainable about a plant that continues to regrow, but uh, it's very nuanced and, and complicated. Um, I found an article from uh, New York Magazine's food section called Grub Street uh, that we'll be looking at, uh, looking at the future of sushi. Um, and this has been kind of a narrative that's been thrown out there in, in the media over the past few months is this shift of, of not only products, <laughs> of not only products on the market, such as like meat replacement products, we've seen a lot of that, like Impossible Meat or Beyond Meat, but also of the menus that chefs are offering and of being either completely plant-based or having, like in today's article, we'll see how uh, a sushi chef is changing his menu uh, to take into consideration all the sustainability issues. Um, yeah, Don, you, Don says that uh, his friend said if he watched it, he'd never eat fish again. Um, I've heard that from a lot of people. I don't know. Uh, the, the documentary's been out for a few months now. I don't know if people are still holding through to that conviction that they never want to eat fish again. Uh, but yeah, I've heard the documentary is really compelling and letting you know the dangers of not only the fishing industry, uh, but all types of industries that really don't take into consideration the health and abundance of the ocean. Um, it's something easy to forget, you know, we don't live there. Um, you know, of course, unless you live in like an island environment, then it's kind of hard not to, to constantly be thinking about it. Uh, but then at the same time, if you're living on an island environment, it's also very possible to have a sustainable relationship with a seafood diet. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's places like here in Las Vegas, you think about it, there is an abundance of incredible seafood restaurants, sushi restaurants that have an abundance of, of fish. And you wonder how we're in the middle of <laughs> we're in the middle of the desert here. How's that happen? Uh, and it's not just here in Vegas. It's it's all over the world. And you know, I think fish and seafood has a general perception of being a healthy meat option. Um, but you know, I think even just beyond our own personal values and convictions of like, we're gonna stop eating something or we're gonna try to take on a plant-based diet. I think the industry itself is going to be making those decisions for us. 
uh, because they're dealing with large logistical issues and price differences. Um, so they're having to change their menus to make their food more accessible to people, but you know, maybe they can't afford to, to source as much fish. So, you know, a lot of these sustainability issues that some of us may spend our nights staying up thinking about constantly and worrying about um, will kind of figure themselves out just through the normal market effects. So don't feel so responsible that, that you have to make all the right decisions and fix all the problems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a tea sleuth, what's your seafood diet? <laughs> Don, Don already said, I'm on a seafood diet. I see it and I eat it. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> I remember that one a lot. I'm going to drink some tea. I haven't drank tea today. I haven't drinking any caffeine today. I, uh... You know, I'm talking about seafood today because I just spent the weekend um, at the ocean. I went uh, to Orange County, Southern California uh, to spend some time on the beach in the ocean. I did go into the, uh, did go into the water. <laughs> You're not old, Don. I, I, I bet that we, uh, we're probably not that far in age, <laughs> which means you're not old. <laughs> which means that you're not old. Of course, as always, thank you to the music supplied by our good friend, Justin Sojourner. Oh, yum, you just had a breakfast skillet with crab? That sounds decadent. That sounds decadent. Do you know uh, the, um, the source of your crab? Like, was it, was it crab that like you crabbed yourself sustainably? Was it in a can? Oh, you're turning 41? Yeah, we're not that far apart. We're not that far apart. <laughs> Over the hill. Yeah, Justin with the buffs. <laughs> oh, shirimi. So that means that it wasn't real crab. It was like crab with the K. <laughs> crab with the K. Tea you like crab, you like being a crab? Well, I, I get that. I mean, most, uh, what do they call that? Most um, fuddy-duddies are crabs, right? They're a little crabby. <laughs> so the tea that I'll be drinking today is a handmade small batch black tea from Assam, India. This is my, my friend Rajan had sent this to me last year as a, a special gift. This is not a tea that we sell. You know, a lot of the farmers that we work with, they will make super small special batches and they're kind of like test, you know, pilot batches to test out a new plant variety or a new processing style. Let's see here, how, how like long and wiry this is. This is like not very common of, of orthodox teas from Assam. You know, the equipment that's used for processing these types of teas typically break up the leaf into small little pieces uh, so you, that's how you can tell this is this is handmade which is unique it is unique <laughs> beast fremont thanks for stopping by and hanging out cool local vegas friend you came you came for the sojourner beats yeah i typically play justin's music during my streams it's just the easiest he gave me um, he gave me a drive filled with I think it's like 29 hours of music, so it's more than enough to <laughs> to stay you know um, to stay kind of fresh, uh, and then I don't have to deal with um, any licensing issues because even if you use softwares that offer like plug and play license free music that you can play, I'm not a musician so. Unfortunately, I'm not creative enough, creative enough to create my own music. Um, you get so much issues, uh, and I just I don't want to fall down that slippery slope of of when things do start getting much more regulated, of losing my content or losing 
our channel's credibility. So thank you so much to Sojourner for hooking up the beats. Yeah, on Friday night I was streaming to Reddit and I had quite a quite a healthy audience. Probably probably a little over a thousand people joined in to hang out. I was talking about, hey Nick, what up, what's up, what's up? <laughs> Um, it had a, a little over a thousand people on Reddit. We were having a conversation, a very awesome conversation about intercultural experiences that ended up turning into a very deep conversation about the, um, the constructs of empathy, crazy empathy and survival. Um, and, uh, yeah. I had one particularly very passionate viewer on Reddit that uh, really dug <laughs> Justin's music. <laughs> yeah, I was watching your, you were streaming like your, uh, your mod synth uh, that day. That was interesting. I think that that's something kind of cool that, that you could play on and um, you know, definitely with more like built-in interactivity, like if you're physically not there, which is kind of cool, that's kind of cool, like that you're not there and then chat has the opportunity of influencing what happens. I think that that could be wildly popular. I kind of had fun with it, even though there wasn't interactivity there. Nick, how are you doing, buddy? It's been so long been so long you know Scott Scott Levkoff is back in town and um, I'm, I'm trying to get him to, to come into the studio to create some content so um, if that happens I'll let you know maybe you can stop by and hang out with us Philip K. Dick. Cool. I'll check him out. Thanks for that recommendation. I got so many recommendations on Friday. We got a lot of catching up on, on all of the reading. Um, but, uh, you know, basically what it boils down to on Friday night in our, in our discussion that we had was that um, there's so much skepticism that has made uh, empathy so difficult. That's where we're at. So how to how how to rid that? How how just to become loyal loyal dog like companions that can just unconditionally love and, and, and empathize with with everybody and everything. We'll get there. It's it's not mission impossible. It's it's possible. It's very possible. Oh, cool. He wrote a book that became Blade Runner. I've heard of The Man in the High Castle. I have not read that, but I'll look into it. <laughs> Skepticism has made empathy uh, difficult? Yeah. Because empathy requires you to be in someone else's shoes, basically. I mean, that's like the dumbed down version of empathy. It's much deeper than that, but... If you are skeptical of not even people, but just skeptical of everything, that that everything is against you, um, it's it's hard to even find the energy to empathize, because because energy is a practice, as someone had pointed out. So it's an active practice. It's once you become good at it, and once all the skepticism is gone, that practice seems seamless it seems very easy but uh when the skepticism is there yeah you've got to work really hard on that you've got to work really really hard on it but that's the value of intercultural relations uh intercultural well i guess relationships but experiences is more appropriate overarching term for that and that intercultural experiences at face value are are not fully effective there's other active 
practice that you have to integrate with it. Um, which in the research paper that I was referencing in the talk, they were talking about like study abroad programs. They were talking about the effectiveness of study abroad programs and how a lot of universities are investing in study abroad programs so that, you know, I ideally they would love all college students to have study abroad because it gives them that intercultural experience, but they came to find that the experience in and of itself does not yield the empathy that that is the ultimate goal or the emotional intelligence that is the ultimate goal in it. Um, that, that the programs that implement additional practice in addition to the, uh, the, the inhabitation in a foreign community, in a different community, um, and, and the, the main one was uh, reflection, like constant reflection of, of not even reflecting just on like what your experience is day to day, but like really trying to dive in to understand the similarities and the differences, like the parallels and the, the differences. Um, and in doing that, you acquire what they called in this research paper, student mobility. But I thought that concept was pretty cool. I've, you know, the, the, the term mobility that I've seen it in, in that sense, not in like physical mobility, but uh, in like social economic mobility, I've seen a lot, but never seen it in student mobility. Uh, but that's just like us as students evolving our emotional intelligence to a higher state of empathy. So, you know, they say travel, is a really great way to get that, but tr not just travel alone. I mean, fuck, if you go travel with like a colonizer mentality, you're not gonna get shit out of it. Actually, you may actually devolve back to a stronger state of skepticism and of distrust and of siloing versus understanding we're all just one, man. We're all just one. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. That's really cool. He spent a lot of his work exploring the distinct lack of human empathy inherent in some people. Yeah. And that skepticism. That skepticism in the process. The process of nature. And then, like, w w I say we because we're, we're the fuckers. We're the fuckers. We're, we're the ones doing it. Like... I'm like surrounded by technology and <laughs> so I say we because we're the ones that have kind of created that mechanical behavior. Well, we didn't create it, we just are in it. Um, and that pulls us away from the inherent human empathy. But we can evolve, we can evolve, yeah. Yeah, we have relationships with, with all types of people. Oh, fuck that. Yeah, that's such a good point. <laughs> people that go on trips and come back and say everything else in the world is dirty and lesser than the US, yeah. That's the wrong mentality. That's such a wrong mentality. Yeah, you didn't you didn't really see that place if that's the if that's the conclusion you come back with. That's a great quote. The U.S. is a third world country wearing a Gucci belt. I don't have a Gucci belt. I'm okay with that. <laughs> but I am under the poverty line, so I'll take that. <laughs> I'm cool with that. I, I actively engage with that identity and am proud of it. And, you know, it's part of the work. I think it's important for... Um, for these things to evolve is um, normalizing poverty, normalizing not having money, normalizing valuing other things in your life outside of money would do wonders. It would do wonders. <laughs> Nick, where's your Gucci belt? <laughs> uh, 
Oh my gosh, I, I've got my I've got my pitcher full of tea. I'm ready to go. Yeah, I haven't drank any caffeine or done anything. Actually, I'll be honest. Up until about two hours ago, I was sleeping. Uh, I arrived back from California at like six o'clock this morning. I had a late night hanging out with my cousin, which was great. I'm so happy. But I, I slept all day. <laughs> Don, you love your Gucci. I'm sure you do. This is my Gucci tea pitcher, my tea fairness pitcher. This is my Gucci uh, tea display dish. <laughs> oh, you got some Prada? <laughs> Oh, you got the loafers, of course. That's totally your style, Nick. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I, like, I argue necessarily for higher wages. <laughs> but uh, I, I argue for higher dignity. Um, and in some cases, it is associated with what wages, like, like such of what's going on in the hospitality industry right now with, with people still arguing that, that unemployment, like uh, the high unemployment income is keeping people from working. Hi, Jonelle, good to see you. I am drinking a handmade black tea from uh, Rajan Barua at Heritage Assam Tea. He sent this as a gift to me last year. You can see it's not too heavily oxidized. There still is a little bit of, of greenness on the uh, some parts of the leaf. Really beautiful. Look at this liquor, though. Vibrant, clean. I didn't even use a filter on this. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. And then this iced with some, like, infused apricots or whatever. You know, that's in season right now. And maybe some lemon and a... A little bit of honey, Whew. that would be good. That would be so good. Yeah, in some cases it's higher wages, but in most cases it's just gosh darn dignity. That's all it's about. Oh, you wanna hear about the fish? Okay, Nick, all right, thanks for getting us back on subject. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about some fish. Let's do that, let's do it. That's a good idea. Um, it's all related. We can continue to talk about dignity and, and money and all of these things. But uh, this is an article that published this morning. Yeah, Janelle, I know you love their tea. You love that that firewood green. You're a big fan of that one. Um, strong tea. So yeah, Janelle, that's something I've learned about you. You like your tea to have a strong bite to it, a strong punchiness to it, and and a song's terroir, the the leaf material they use there in deeper gars definitely nice and brisk so this is from new york magazine uh, it's a restaurant review um, but what i found fascinating about it was that it gave a pretty good outline of the evolving menu at um this sushi restaurant and has some pretty good quotes from the chef about yeah it's relevant nick everything is relevant everything is the same don't you know we are all one man. There we go. I did not eat any seafood when I went to California, unfortunately. I ate all my own food that I packed. I'm like at that point now. I'm I'm really not. Um, yeah, I'm 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 like still in like savor mode. I'm I'm feeling like it's really important to still like conserve and and save <laughs> the green tea gang, yeah. Oh, cool, that, that's a that's a um, connoisseur level tea comment you made there. You like clean tasting teas with a fairly high caffeine content. Well, you should come have tea at my tea room in Chinatown. I could totally hook you up, totally hook you up with that experience, we've got that. Uh, so yeah, this is a review of Rosella, a local and sustainable sourcing uh, Trump's traditional supply chains. And like a few years ago, you would see a headline like this in a food magazine, but it was more of like a trendy thing. You know, in, in this, this article, we'll, we'll see that related to that Seaspiracy, hey, Grandmaster Ong, what's up? What's up? 
<laughs> What's up? Thanks for stopping by and saying hi. Oh, you've got you got your car getting fixed. Well, I'm wishing the best of luck on that. Hit me up. Maybe I'll I'll come pick you up. I used to be an Uber driver. If it's if it's like about sharing the tea love, I'm all over it. I'm all I will come pick you up. We will we'll have ourselves a nice tea party. Happy Monday to you. I hope you had a beautiful weekend. I did. I went to uh, Laguna Beach. I went to Thousand Steps Beach. Uh, highly recommend that beach. And I don't mind publicly recommending that because, fuck, I don't got a big community. So uh, it's not like y'all are going to be storming the beach. But uh, Thousand Steps Beach in Laguna Beach. Uh, ample free public street parking. Uh, there's a little bit of a hike to get to the beach, which means not a lot of people go. Uh, it is a famous beach, but still not a lot of people go, so I highly recommend that over like Huntington Beach or any other beach that just swarms of of people and swarms of cars and traffic and whatever. Like most businesses in the city, the restaurant industry is filled these days with rumors of disruption and change. Will the tourists come back? Probably. Will the rent stay low? No. Will the business lunch ever return to fashion? Not to mention the good old lunchtime salad munched Furtively in your messy cubicle? Hmm. Does Daniel Hum's Twitter shaking announcement that 11 Madison Park, which is the number one rated restaurant in the country. Fancy, fancy restaurant. Oh, thank you for the follow. Thank oh, cool. Thanks for the follow, man. We're fam now. Uh, 11 Madison Park is going to a meatless menu. That's huge. That was a huge announcement. We talked about that a few weeks ago. In the immediate post-pandemic future means the death of hot cuisine as we know it, most likely. Will the $30 all-beef gourmet burger endure during this urgent, newly reimagined era, never mind the fat cat expense account fueled New York Steakhouse? And will the legions of Zoom adult sushi bros return to their windowless ritualized amakase bunkers and start forking over thousands of dollars for shreds of endangered tuna ever again. Not after they saw Seaspiracy. The big city steakhouse is probably safe for now, but if you want a glimpse into what the disrupt future might look like for the other fat cat expense account destination, the sushi parlor, I suggest you book a seat at Rosello, which opened late last year in a comfortably stylish East Village space across from Tompkins Square Park. The sushi master is residence Jeff Miller, went to college in Gainesville, Florida and trained in Austin, Texas instead of Tokyo, Osaka, or LA. In most evenings, you'll find him preparing his artful nigiri menu wearing a Florida Gators cap on his head. Instead of Japanese symbol or character, the restaurant is named after a breed of Australian parrot. Miller first fell in love with cooking in Australia and unlike any of the more traditional sushi joints around town, Brazilian funk plays over the sound system along with the occasional dulce bouncy song by The Clash. Uh, that's cool, Brazilian funk. I could get into that. I don't know if I've ever heard Brazilian funk. I'll have to look that up tonight and, and have a listen. But the biggest difference between Rosella and your average hushed priestly pre-pandemic omakase destination is the sourcing of your meal. There are no esoteric shrimp from Hokkaido on the menu or delicate, soury needlefish flown in directly from the chilly waters of Tokyo Bay. Most of the fish is local or curated from sustainable farms in Europe or around the U.S. The sushi rice, which is mingled with vinegar and sake in the traditional way and mixed in wooden tubs four times per day, is grown in California. The fat, pearly shrimp come from the Gulf and scallops are hoisted from the stormy seas off Montauk, and when Miller served me big eye tuna one evening, he took pains to explain that tuna was out of season now, but that his favorite supplier kept choice cuts in the back of the freezer to send to special clients. That sounds good. I don't think I've ever been to a sushi restaurant that did this. Other than, like, I think I went to, like, a sushi restaurant in, like, Africa one time, and they did it because they fucking had to do it. Like, they couldn't, they couldn't make sushi from, um, you know, Japanese ingredients because even here in Vegas, we have like ample sushi restaurants here and they all are serving like 
Japanese fair. Like things flowing in from Japan, they're, you know, I don't know what the current status of the supply chain is now. I'm, I'm sure it's been challenged and they're fumbling to figure out the future, but you've heard about this guy before? I bet. I mean, I'm sure I'm actually going to be in New York in a couple of weeks. Maybe I'll convince my mom to, to go, uh, check out, check out this food with me. <laughs> it seems a little pricey, but you know, research, I'll, I'll call it research. <laughs> but yeah, I went to Africa one time and it was so inspiring. It was so cool. I mean, all of the international fair there, like, uh, even in the, the smaller towns, you would see an Italian restaurant you see, I don't think I ever saw like a Mexican restaurant, but I, I did see like a Japanese inspired sushi style restaurant um, near a, a lake, like a town that had a lake that had a lot of fish. It was all freshwater fish, but they figured that shit out and it was pretty tasty and it was interesting. And, um, you know, last week I went over an article talking about the dangers of authentic food because in the argument for authentic food those those sushi restaurants those like african restaurants that are trying to figure out how to apply their their local products to international cuisine would be deemed um bastardizing or would be deemed un unauthentic but as we learned last week Authentic is the state of realness. So unless your food is made out of fucking plastic, it is authentic, okay? So like you have to like dig into the story of like why it is. Like why is this sushi made from the local fish from the pond right here? Um, what's this history? Like who was the person that thought of that idea? They could have been Japanese and moved there and decided that they wanted to do that. And what is inauthentic about that you know so just just a reminder like our attachment to authenticity is like just don't eat plastic that's it my portion of big eye tuna didn't quite offer the opulent forbidden pleasures of the finest grade fatty or toro belly from tokyo or spain but the texture was more or less perfect and at seven dollars per feet per piece it cost roughly a third of the price a third of the price, so usually you're paying $21. Well, that is, that's a dining I definitely don't do. <laughs> the tuna is served here in spicy roll form or in generous slices over pats of rice, but my favorite iteration is a crudo composition that the kitchen rolls into tubes dressed, dresses with long ribbons of mint and mango and plates and a pool of olive oil and coconut milk. If you enjoy a little smoke, call for the stillhead trout, which is cured with burnt applewood. Ooh, that sounds good or the amberjack, which is smoked in walnut wood. Although for the ultimate and classic sushi pleasure, I recommend the delicious Montauk scallops, which are topped with bulbs of finger lime to cut their natural, almost fruity sweetness. All right, I'm definitely taking, um, taking my mom here. That looks good, all these like smoked things. This might be the future of sushi, Platy, cried my, my friend, the Tokyo Well, a connoisseur of the old school who has dined in venerable sushi destinations around Japan and New York. Like me, he couldn't quite tell whether his enthusiasms were a product of the dinner itself or having had to subsist for the past year in a sushi-deprived world filled with pandemic bean recipes and random bags of carry-out. I don't know. I mean, it's so funny. Like, I don't know if this is just a Vegas thing, but... What about like, okay, so um, <laughs> that's the issue though, is like, you say, hell no, tuna nigiri is $5 for two pieces. Well, honestly, if you go to all you, all you can eat place, like most places have unlimits, no limits on nigiri ordering. So you can like really price that out. But is like what's in question in this article and what's in question with the documentary Seaspiracy is that the commodification of fish has put a huge strain on the health of our oceans. And there, regardless of how you feel ethically about that, doesn't matter. It's like the actual logistics of the business and of the sustainability of that supply, it's in question. 
And so that's why restaurants like this are trying to pave a new path. Um, you know, this is the first time that I've seen a food review like this of, of somebody like really going outside. Yeah, $26 all you can eat. You can eat all of it. <laughs> um, they do put a limit on the, um, on the sashimi. Actually, a lot of restaurants don't even include sashimi on the all you can eat because they're smart because if you're eating just the fish, you could eat infinite. I mean, at least I know I can. That's why it's like throw some rice in there so we can satiate them a bit so they'll stop eating at some point. Um, but like, what about, um, cause they were talking specifically about the big eye tuna, like the otoro, which is like the fatty tuna. I think the price on that is usually a little bit different. It's, it's usually a little bit higher cause like the standard, you know, commodity tuna, uh, is a lot cheaper for restaurants to source. And so they can, they can put it on the all you can eat menu or they can, you know, do two pieces for $5 as you say. Um. I love sashimi though. Even non-Japanese sashimi. I've had really great sashimi style raw fish. Even um, in the most unlikely places. I was in Chaozhou, China, uh, which is pretty close to the coast, but they were doing it from freshwater fish. So they were probably getting it from a lake somewhere. Seems super sketchy, but you know, my policy, I'm a food scientist and you know, not a lot of like foodborne illnesses are undetectable from the outside. Like if it smells fishy, like, yeah, just don't eat it, like stay away from it. But if it smells fresh and smells like the water it came from, um, there are very few foodborne illnesses that will be there. Not to say that there's not, there totally could be. Anything could be possible. There are undetectable very sly little, sly little buggers that can get in there and, and cause cause some trouble in your digestive system. But um, I love sashimi. Some people just can't eat it at all. They cannot. Anything raw. But like me, he was surprised by the level of technical skill exhibited by Miller and his chef partner sidekick, Yoni Lang, whose hometown culinary terroir happens to be New Orleans. He had few quibbles with the quality of the rice, it can be a little hard, or the soy mixed daily with dashi and sake, or the signature eggy house tamago, which isn't too soft or too sweet, and which Miller frets over constantly, the way to get great Tokyo sushi masters do. Unlike the great Tokyo Sushi Masters, however, Miller and Lang aren't weighed down by centuries of formal tradition, and they aren't afraid to push the boundaries here and there. You'll find a refreshing oyster shooter on the omakase menu with the pomegranate juice and an icy lime granita, and an inventive shrimp stuff etouffee hand roll anointed with proper just whisk roux. You can get rice bowls dappled with pickled tomatillos at the neighborly establishment in an excellent sushi and rice Chitasashi folded with chunks of avocado along with the usual bounty of fish. The kitchen even serves up a version of Malaysian laksa noodle soup. Well, that's a trend. That is like bidia. And the fine house ramen poured with a rich seafood broth. And if you still have room for dessert, there's chocolate cremol touched with sake lees and a cool ama amazake rice pudding garnished with bits of mandarin orange and a cloud of chantilly cream. That doesn't look like that. I wanted the picture of the chantilly cream. Where, where is this? Maybe that's it. That looks interesting. I don't know. That picture is not very appetizing. I'm sorry, Food Magazine. Um, Sakana, I have not been to Sakana. Maybe I have been to Sakana. <laughs> this is making you hungry, Nick. This is making you hungry. <laughs> uh, I haven't had Sakana, but I've had um, Kaizen, which that one used to be my favorite, but I think Yama. Yama is pretty, pretty good. Yeah, the other stuff. All right, let me, let me go back up to the good looking stuff. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Is that the scallop? 
Yeah, this is the scallop. Mmm, that looks clean. That looks so clean. Yeah, I'm gonna check out the menu actually. Yeah, I like Yama Sushi. Like the one in Chinatown is okay, but I think the other one is even better. The one on, um, whoops. Sorry about the yeah. Uh, the one on, um, is it Trop? No, it's on Flamingo, Flamingo, Maryland area. The place was called Rosella. I'm gonna check out the menu. How much how much out of budget this is gonna be for, for me and my mom? Yama, yeah. You know, it's not that expensive. It's really not that expensive. But look how short this menu is. This is it. This is the menu. This is the future of not just sushi, but of food in general. Like all restaurants you go to, like that whole Cheesecake Factory menu model that, um, it's like you just need to focus on what's really good. And then whenever a chef can do that, then their supply chain can be a lot more sustainable, can be a lot more quality versus them constantly trying to run around and source all these things consistently. So I guess the, the nigiri here, oh look, so you either get one piece nigiri or three pieces of sashimi. I'd rather just do the sashimi. Yeah, I definitely wanna go check this place out. <laughs> yeah, Goemon is 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 good. But yeah, it's like I feel like Goemon is similar to Kaizen. Like it's not as good as I remember it being. But this is gonna be it and this is gonna be normalized. You know, I think like five years ago it was a little bit taboo to have like a short menu. But this is great, you don't need much. So like, you know, there's probably a shit ton of ingredients on this menu that the chef still has to manage, but at least it's shorter than, you know, the cheesecake, cheesecake Factory is the worst. All the jokes are around that. It's like a freaking book they bring out to you, which means more than likely most of the stuff is like, yeah, coming out. So yeah, Nick, you brought up a good, a good concept of the... The, the midnight diner and that that concept is almost like street food it's almost like street food which you know you hang out any amount of time on my channel you know how much of a fan I am of street food uh, that's like the ultimate model that I want to support and like this like this being fine dining this being like the established like dine-in model is the gateway to street food being normalized. So that's why I also support things like this because it's like normalizing shorter menus, unique products, you know, that might be outside of the box. And, and also, yeah, doing that work of reestablishing the idea of authentic um, because yeah, that, that movement has done a lot of damage to the restaurant industry. But yeah, Midnight Diner, uh, I recommend that show if you haven't seen that show. I also recommend Samurai Gourmet, another show on Netflix, uh, both about Japanese dining. And it's like no frills. 
extremely excellent and it does include food porn so if you're into the food porn thing you're gonna get it there you know where they're cooking they're cooking things and it just is sizzling and, and, and cooking so perfect uh, but limited menus you know you go to a restaurant and they specialize in just one thing you know like this this menu here is is very common to what you will see in a sushi restaurant or a sushi um, izakaya in Japan short menu a lot of times they don't even have a menu the really good sushi restaurants don't even have a menu it's just like one flat fee everybody knows that they're gonna have to pay a certain amount it's usually a little pricey but it's fucking good uh, and it usually includes all you can drink so if you're a drinker you can get your money's worth <laughs> um, and yeah this is like multiple courses and just very small dishes just like perfect little succulent bites That's a good point. Menus are too that are too long are also bad for a customer psychology standpoint. You get your customers into choice paralysis and each party is taking like 10 minutes longer than they need to at the table. That is a very good point because especially right now with the shortage of labor, the shortage of like front of house staff, um, yeah, chef's choice. Um, it's really difficult. Now, there was another article that I was potentially going to read today, completely unrelated to this topic, so I'm not, I'm not looking at that, but um, that was about, like, the automation of, like, food ordering, which is interesting. You know, automation in the food industry, in the hospitality industry, uh, was hot news maybe, like, two or three years ago. Uh, here in Las Vegas, a big deal. Like, they had, like, these robotic bartenders and shit. I think they still have one at um, the mall in the Planet Hollywood. As you enter inside, there's, like, this really cool, like, robotic bartending thing. And at first, people were really, like, against it because that's threatening jobs. But now, now that <laughs> the people have, like, reclaimed their own dignity in their own lives and, and said, well, you know, we don't want those jobs now, um, it's kind of opening up. The, the dialogue around what can be automated. Now, I was trying to have this conversation with my friend Jean, who is, uh, he's been on this series with me. He's an accomplished, iconic. I use the word iconic because, you know, very few people deserve that title, but he deserves it. Um, iconic French chef that built um, two of the, probably the most influential iconic restaurants in the Bay Area uh, that still exist today that still have the same menu that he established so I always like to pick his brain about these types of things and I talked to him about the automation problem or not the problem but the automation opportunity and uh, he was very much against it um, so I, I feel like there's still kind of an emotional um, uh, yeah an emotional response uh, to that but we're gonna get there you know at least some points of it like having some type of host who's gonna hold that space for you and like describe the food to you and give you that human interaction between the menu and the food that can't be automated but certain things I think can be yeah the robotic baristas there's a whole company I don't know how they're doing uh, called X X cafe I was actually talking to them about supplying matcha because uh, one of my friends was briefly their COO. Um, that didn't go through because they were looking for, like they, they were doing good coffee, but the, the matcha part on the service was, was difficult for them. They were looking for something that was already pre-blended with, with all of the other bells and whistles that are expected from a matcha latte. See, that's interesting. Okay, so you bring up a good point. Uh, automating in the store ordering process can be slow. Um, do you think that that's like a UI issue? Like a user interface issue? That's that's what I feel it is. Because, yeah, I have. Like, uh, a lot of, like, restaurants have started doing, like, um, like, apps, and you can, like, order online. They, like, try to recommend save time, don't stand in line, order and pay online, and you end up spending more time dealing with the app and doing all these things, but I feel like it's more of a, a UI. I've heard that Chipotle's app 
is kind of like the gold standard for that. Um, I've just heard from like firsthand testimony from friends and family. Um, but I think that the, uh, the, the intuitive nature of that app has a lot to do on the loyalty and ordering from that place. And so that's kind of an issue. Um, you know, if it's just your first time ordering from a place or if you're just passing through and you just want to order there, then it's not going to be as intuitive for you. But like if you're, if you're ordering from that establishment once a week, uh, I think those, those apps are, are built to make it very easy. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a good observation, Nick. That you you would have more resources available to to put more focus on the the quality of the ingredients if you have less payroll. But then you have like all of the upfront costs of these systems because these like robotics companies that are creating these softwares and hardwares <laughs> they want to get paid too, you know. I think that's like a barrier. All right, I like, uh, yeah, please give your suggestions. I like this. So the utopian dream of automation is to give people more free time. We can't do that under late capitalism. We can't build poverty into the system while turning everything into a luxury good service. Huh. That is something to think about. <laughs> Nick, you're fucking still ordering Starbucks? What the heck, man? I thought <laughs> I thought you had more self-worth than that. <laughs> it was a dark time. <laughs> extra, extra roasted. You got your Charbucks very dark time <laughs> well okay so all right I, I like that so like you say automating orders would make it sense if a place treats their food in a modular way like trying to order something simple to say McDonald's or Jack in the Box but leave out ketchup throws a huge rent in the, the process so and uh, normalizing the concept of chef's choice how's that You know, and if, if the industry is more fragmented, meaning like there's lots of smaller little businesses that you can choose to order from, then um, the diversification and the competition between all of these fragmented businesses could be the, this customization, right? So it's like you go to this place and it's like you order one thing and that's it. You know, like in all the examples I know of street food, in India or you know when I lived in Africa is like there could be a lineup of, of 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 people selling the same things and it's like everyone is a little bit different and it could be a difference in the customization it could be a difference in how they dress the product it could be a difference in you know their special recipe of what they do and it's like people choose where they want to eat based off of that versus and you know they just go order because it's a fast thing like don't go to a street food vendor and like ask for a special thing on this or this or this. It's like if a street food vendor gives you an option, it's usually like, do you want everything or noth nothing? It's like an all or nothing type of thing. Um, you're not putting a custom order in with your street food because it's, it's so high, pa high pace. Are you a picky eater? Is that, is it, are you uh, confessing? Are you admitting your... I don't know, just ideas, just ideas. Yeah, because it seems like on this menu for this restaurant, there's not, there's not a whole lot of opportunity for, oh, thank you, 77, for the follow. Thank you, John.
Yeah, yeah, where there's not a lot of options. And you're too picky. Well, what if you found a chef? What if you found a chef that was within your, your preference? That you truly trusted? And then it was also normalized, just like it's normalized now. It's not even normalized. It is like regulated that food companies have to list allergens, right? This is just one example. So Quinn, you want to come say hi? Oh, he finally woke up from his nap. <laughs> oh, he's a tired pup. He sat out in the sun on the beach all day yesterday. He loved it, but I think it, it took him out on him. Like, he slept the entire car ride last night, and he just now woke up from his nap. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, like, normalized uh, for, for chefs to, um, to communicate through their menus. Uh, you know, like, different specifics of different dietary restrictions or ingredients. I don't know. I mean, this is not all like set in stone laws that we need to set. You know, this is just an open conversation. Of course, this is like a uh, a manifesto, a manifesto of of where we could see the industry going that would be sustainable. Because yeah, there's a lot on the table that's that's in question. Um, okay, okay. Bitcoin says hello to everybody. He's glad to be here. Happy to be here. He's interested in eating some of that, some of that sushi. Uh, Nick says there's a great bit from Curb Your Enthusiasm where Larry David asks his waiter to ask the chef if he can broil his fish instead of pan sear, but he tells the waiter if the chef makes a face, tell him don't bother. <laughs> That's a personality trait. <laughs> what is that? That's like, I mean, that's kind of passive aggressive. That is not passive aggressive. What would be the, the description? I mean, I think that's Larry David's personality, right? Yes, my dog's name is Bitcoin. This is Bitcoin. His name has been Bitcoin since 2013. Uh, Tlet, uh, the uh, channel that we're in right now, my business. I, I hate to call myself Tlet. A lot of people just make that broad generalization. I am the only person that works full-time on TLED. Other, well, he's, he's the full-time dog here. Um, but we're a network, we're a big network, so that's why I don't like to say I am TLED, but um, we are a B2B supply chain marketplace, so software. And uh, we were one of the first Bitcoin merchants in the world. We launched the first altcoin payment processor. Mm. And now we almost exclusively do all of our international trade between small family farms around the world uh, utilizing um, cryptocurrency. So we're one of them people, but not one of them people. I'm not gonna sit here and talk about how awesome crypto is with you, uh, but I certainly am happy to answer any questions or share our story. Moog. That's a cute name. <laughs> yeah, Bitcoin's really de uh, redefined the term tea pet. That's right. Um, oh, yeah, uh, John, you were asking me what tea I'm drinking today. I am drinking a handmade black tea from Assam, India. This was handmade by my friend Rajan Barua. Uh, he has a factory called Heritage Assam Tea. This was uh, from last year's production. He had sent it as a gift to me. We don't sell this on the marketplace. Uh, this is just a um, small gift that was given. Really nice, super malty. I mean, that's that's the the general terroir note of Assam tea is maltiness, crispness, uh, which makes it really uh, good suited for like iced tea or sweet tea or milk tea. Uh, I am drinking this just black, just hot and straight. I mean, black tea, but it's it's not super highly oxidized. You can still see how white it is. Now, if I was to brew it for a longer time, it would come out darker, but then it would also come out 
uh, with too, too much of the tannins released, which would make the tea um, a little bit more unpleasant with the with the astringency from the tannins. So I like to brew these teas in the Chinese style um, of Gung Fu Cha, where you use a lot of leaf. You can see how, how full my Gai Wan is. There's a lot of leaf in here. But I only steep it for, you know, 15, 20 seconds. But then I can re-steep it several times. You're into six coins. Well, I wish you all the best with all those coins. Outside of the um, capital gains that you may receive from the, um, you know, increase of, of market value of those coins. I hope that those coins all serve you well in your general goals of seeing the world become a better place for you. You know, and that's another important thing to, to, to understand about crypto, um, especially now that we're, I mean, not now, it's fucking been always, that the value goes up and down and you should expect that to continue, right? Um, so it, it's just a reminder of how volatile you know, these can be as an investment tool. And so at the end of the day, it is most important that you find and support the coins uh, that are bringing more value to your world outside of just it, it as an investment tool. And it's really cool. There's a lot of really great coins out there, um, you know, that are offering different products and different, different um, opportunities. Which coins are you into, if you don't mind sharing? I don't hold any coins. Uh, you know, I, I do have just personally a little bit of Bitcoin. Uh, we The company has never bought any Bitcoin, but we have sold over 250. So that just gives you kind of a reference of, uh, of the movement of coin that we've done in our business. It's very possible to find value from coins without like buying them as an investment tool. Uh, you know, I, I don't discourage it. You know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great additional diversified investment tool in our world in addition to stocks, in addition to, um, you know, angel investing and venture capital. But um, again, you know, like the, the use that we see in Bitcoin is that, um, and other coins too. It's not always just Bitcoin that's being used in our business. But um, when we send payment, we work with rural farmers in Japan and in India and in China. And when I use traditional bank wires to send them payment for the business on our mar marketplace, uh, about 12% is the average fee. Not fee, I mean, I, I don't like to call it a fee because there's several, like that's the average amount of money that is absorbed by that banking system, which usually involves several different businesses, banks, even governments. The government will intermediate and they'll take, they'll take a little bit of value from that transaction. Anytime money is moved, you know, there, there's value involved in that. Um, and so with crypto, we can, we can make that movement more efficient. Home bitty, home bitty boy, yeah. Oh, he's really happy today. And Nick says, I love learning about blockchain and the future implications, but lose interest in the stock-like mentality and short-term volatility. Good, Nick. That's good. Yeah, I, I let go of that. I mean, I could have. I could have, you know, gotten really excited about it as an investment thing because we started, we started doing work with Bitcoin when it was worth like $75 a coin. So, you know, we could have been like, okay, let's let it roll. Let's risk it and let it roll. And it, it would have served us. It would have served us. But um, I, I just, you know, I've, I've let go of that fascination because it could have also not served us too, you know. And that's not what matters here. We really want to support a good distributed, diversified, transparent future then um, we gotta we gotta trust these things more than just short-term gains. The 
Did you get Sheba? I've heard that like over. Well, and uh, Josh was telling me about another one. Um, but my brother has been doing really, really well with uh, with Sheba. Oh, there he is. Michael's here talking about his Sheba Inu. Michael says we got to get Bitcoin a, a Sheba costume. <laughs> yes, he would make a really cute Sheba. We'll give you like a little fluffy tail. Mm hmm. And that like that like dumb Doge face. Because he's, he's got a little bit of a doge face, but not quite. He's a little too cute. Cardano. Cool. Well, I wish you the best of luck with all those coins. Oh, Nick, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, are you still holding your safe, Moon? I say just hold it. Like, if you're going to make a decision, like, this day trading stuff, like, it can be exciting to try to get into that. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you're just going to come out even, right? Because you're going to lose some, you're going to win some. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily imply that you're gonna lose. It doesn't imply that you're always gonna win. Um, but there's like work. Day trading requires a lot of work and a lot of like emotional investment to keep up with that. So, um, you know, that's something to consider. But like investing in something, uh, yeah, just hold it and trust it. Just be part of that process. You like a nice aged and oxidized tea full of tannins. Awesome, John. Which uh, which type of tea? Like which origin of tea is your favorite? Or which type of tea is your favorite? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I said it's like really important to like invest in coins that like bring value to your world more than just its potential gain. You know, and that potential gain will just be a cherry on top. But like if that coin is gonna help resolve a, a problem that, that is close to you or something you're passionate about, fuck yeah. What happened to Shiva, Michael? What happened to Shiva? You never know. You never know. You know, some of these co these coins may have products that um, are like ahead of their time. Oh, Shiva went down. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. See, that's that's the thing. You, you were so excited about it a couple weeks ago. We just need our, our um, spaceman to, to tweet more, to tweet more. <laughs> Get those prices to go up. Isn't that incredible? Like Elon Musk has like manifested this personality and this influence in the world that like, someone compared him to like the Federal Reserve. Like his actions have that much influence on, on the economy of of these coins as the Federal Reserve has on the US dollar. It's pumping. It's pumping. <laughs> what about sushi coin? <laughs> sushi coin that you can redeem for um, nigiri and uh, hand rolls. I'm a, I'm a big fan of utility coins, you know, like even from the get go, like from when we started working in, in crypto back in 2013, there were already a pretty cool movement of different utility coins, but I haven't seen any of those applications um, manifest like a true value or, you know, a, a story of, of value just yet. 
Hey Shiloh, good to see you. Thanks for coming by and saying hello. Yeah, we're just drinking, drinking a little uh, handmade black tea from Assam. That's funny, Nick. It is, you're right. Elon's influence is contradictory to the idea of decentralization. Elon's wealth and influence, yeah, is totally, <laughs> is totally a contradiction. What are we gonna do about him? Should we uh, kidnap him and chop him into a bunch of little pieces and say, okay, here is a decentralized Elon Musk. <laughs> Maybe Elon is Satoshi. <laughs> Look at Bitcoin, he's got like his arm around me and he's like holding on to me, he's like grasping. Ooh, what a cutie. Oh, that's funny. It wouldn't hurt, to be honest. We can just chop them up into small little figurative pieces. <laughs> I don't know how that would work, but we can make it work. Oh, that's cool. I'll check out Polygon. Oh, yeah, he's definitely got some puppy warmth. He just woke up from a nap and came over here for some cuddles. Not for the tea. He is not interested in the tea. Just the cuddles. Yeah, the, uh, the efficiency in transactions, that's something that I've heard that um, Tezos, Tezos is good for NFTs, if you're, if you're into NFTs at all, which is cool. So that's a utility token that I think is like making mainstream sense. Um, so it's cool. Like I don't, I don't think that NFTs are just a hype that are going to fade away. I think they're really important. XTZ Purity <laughs> Purity Elon <laughs> Is XTZ Tezos? Is that just another another name for Tezos? Is that like its shortened name? Now Bitcoin wants to play. He's going to get his toy. Oh, okay, that is it. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, a dude processor for some instant pureed Elon. Now, is that going to include or not include the hair plugs? You know, I'm pretty sure that Elon is going to be fine. You should be working on NFTs. You know, and if you go if you go down that route, check out Tezos. Check out, um, you know, all the marketplaces that support Tezos. And actually, there is a Twitch streamer that's based here in Vegas. He's a good friend of mine. He also has been on this Dignified Hospitality segment because he is an established uh, bartender here in Vegas. Uh, he's been doing a lot of advocacy work for NFTs and he runs a podcast where they just like review different, um, well, they invite different artists, guests on that talk about their work. Let's see, I'll find his, his uh, handle and I'll post it so you can follow him and watch his shows. He, uh, he streams only on Thursdays at like 10 a.m. Pacific. I think it's 10. Maybe it's a little later than 10. But he, he streams for a couple of hours and he has different guests on that talk about their art and then he even like browses the different marketplaces and uh, they do give away NFTs on 
the show. So if you hang out there, you can win free NFTs, uh, which, who knows, they may end up developing some value. Speaking of, Nick, you sent me an NFT and I fucking, <laughs> I never, I never went and got it. I'm sorry about that. How disrespectful of me. Ah, oh, where is he? He's got like an interesting um, username that is not the easiest just to find. like PCS underscore something, something. Um, but yeah if you want to get into NFTs understanding how to mint them uh, Nick who is here in chat he's also been exploring that and he's local too but uh, he I don't I don't believe Nick I'm not trying to do this uh, but uh, I don't think that he's like actively putting himself out there as a resource so um, feel free to reach out to him. But this other guy is putting himself out there as a resource. So that's why I want to share his, um, his username. Dang it. I can't find it right now. But uh, Prima Beast, I will totally um, hit you up. I am not. This is just like uh, a standard like factory porcelain guy one. Easy. A bot claimed most of those NFTs, so I can't even get it now, huh? That's fucked up. And so like the the there's bots out there just trying to scour the internet and pick up all the free NFTs that they can find. It's okay. You want me to talk about fish? I'll talk about fish. Fish coin. Wow, John, you you're you're uh you're in the luxury zone with your 2008 uh Lao Ban That's some expensive stuff. The cab driver is talking about them. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, here, let me, uh, yeah, you're the, you're the clay man, you would know. I don't know what, what kind of glaze. It's pretty, pretty shiny. But definitely not as like uh, uh, fine as like the mutton fat porcelain that I've seen. I don't know. Does that help at all, Shiloh? I mean, there's plenty of light here. You don't really see through it, right? Yeah, I want a Nick Can to NFT. Hell yeah. Shiloh, I'm going to get back to your, your message about planning, um, <laughs> planning your session with the virtual tea festival. My mind has just like, it's been really hard for me to work on that project because, um, there's just been so many freaking bottlenecks that, um, have made, made me like very discouraged about this event, um, specifically around getting the new samples here in time so that everybody can like taste the new teas together. Um, I, I think it'll all end up working out, but um, it's just, it's just been stressful. So I've been kind of delaying the planning and there's plenty of time still. It's not like it's going to be last minute for us, but I just feel like we started talking about this months ago 
and my follow-up has been a little delayed so I'm just addressing that but it's still happening uh, in fact I am going to be the reason why I'm going to New York City in a couple of weeks is that I'm gonna be live streaming a fantastic event that's gonna be happening in a open community garden in South Bronx in New York City uh, that's a tea and arts cultural event uh, our good friend Ting from Mujus Mujush, sorry, said that wrong. And New York has been doing this event for the past few years. She gets funding from the, um, I think it's like the Brooklyn Arts Foundation and several other like art foundations in the city uh, to do outdoor tea. It's something kind of similar to WUO, but it's not WUO at all. Um, it's, it's not like a purposeful ceremony of sharing tea. It's just like an outdoor tea experience. Everybody is encouraged to bring their own tea, similar to Wu Wu. Uh, but there are performers, there are uh, different like cultural uh, presentations. Um, and so I'll be live streaming that. So I think like that event is gonna like really energize me for the event that will be coming at the end of June that, that, that we'll be producing for, for the spring harvest. Um, yeah, which is going to include some really cool programming, including like programming um, on on decolonizing tea. Yeah, thank you. You really, it's really important to allow yourself time to just chill the fuck out. Really important. <laughs> Sometimes when you're a business owner or when you're trying to activate something, you're trying to get something moving. Uh, you can come become very stressed out and anxious about not working things on time and personally myself I am not having an anxiety about it the only points of anxiety I have is like when it when it is dealing with someone else's schedule or someone else's communication but yeah one thing at a time it'll happen it'll happen but I'm excited to utilize my IRL live streaming rig. I used it for First Friday a couple of weeks ago here in Vegas, and that was freaking awesome. That was so cool. That was the, the video I ended up catching um, Sojourner and his band DJ Dad shirt at Rebar. Um, that was a lot of fun. I'm really happy with the, the equipment that, that we acquired for for that and so now like I'll be able to go anywhere actually anywhere in the world I have modems that will allow me to get uh, data sim cards anywhere in the world and live stream like really high quality video um, from wherever I'm moving around so they'll be taking that to New York City um, for that outdoor I hope it's a beautiful day it should be we deserve it we totally deserve it. But yeah, I've like gone so far off topic from seafood. <laughs> and uh, I'm gonna go because I've got friends hanging out in the Topia Tea Room, which uh, if you all are still feeling social and wanna hang out, <laughs> uh, you're welcome to come hang out with me in the tea house in Topia. I, uh, uh, we meet on Monday nights at five Pacific, so I'm actually 55 minutes late now. Um, and uh, and on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Pacific. On Monday nights, I do not stream our conversations there. Um, so I will stop the stream and I'll go head over to the tea house. But then on Thursdays, I do stream those conversations. So um, that's a really great time to like hear the interactions and the storytelling and um, the discussion around uh, around the little tea community of tea peeps uh, that we love. And yeah, we do talk about concepts of decolonization. It's a very important important topic. So if that's of interest, Thursdays are a good a good time to watch the stream. Uh, stay updated with the, the conversation. Yeah, Nick, hey, if you're feeling social, uh, drop by the tea house, come hang out with us. It'd be good to hang out. Um, but, uh, oh, you're there now, cool, awesome. I'll be there in just a second. Actually, let me go there now, that way. That way I'm there. Um, yeah, I love you all. Thank you for hanging out, being a part of the conversation. Thank you to all of our new friends that hung out today, talked about seafood and hospitality. It's a good thing, you know? Like, 
Uh, let's see. Okay, so that was the whole like that was the whole moral of doing this stream is that see, conspiracy. I've heard a lot of people have been influenced by it that it has like convinced them to never eat seafood again, and um, that also is not the sustainable choice. The sustainable choice is to be more connected and understand where your food comes from, and um, so uh, researching chefs that are putting in that work to, f to find sustainable, good quality sources of seafood, um, you know, can, can actually be reviving to the, inter to, the, uh, to the ocean and to the environment. Um, because yes, yeah, stopping fishing altogether is, is not the solution. Um, just like stopping agriculture altogether is not the solution of restoring the soil. Um, you know, interplanting and increasing biodiversity in the soil is the solution. And so that means that we actually do need to plant more and eat more. So, um, yeah, don't let documentaries like Seaspiracy um, scare you into thinking that all seafood is bad and that the ocean is doomed. I mean, of course, the ocean is doomed um, even outside of our seafood habit. Uh, the ocean is doomed uh, just from the the acidification of the ocean from our carbon emissions but um, there's still solutions uh, and we can still find ways to enjoy fish uh, but yeah more than likely your fake crab uh, shirimi is not um, not the solution but um, yeah I, I don't know maybe we can we can discuss more uh, practical sustainable seafood uh, solutions but today I just wanted to talk about this specific chef and the work that he is doing to like normalize um, the new concept of authenticity when it comes to seafood uh, specifically sushi um, yeah we can use local more sustainable ingredients and still make authentic food because gosh darn it authentic food is just real not made of plastic not made of rubber made of the real things uh, so I will see you all tomorrow. Uh, I don't know what the programming will be. I was gaming, but that game fucking sucks. So I'm, I'm not going to game that Tea Garden Simulator anymore. I'm just like, I'm fed up with that game. Um, maybe I'll find the other game. Uh, yeah, there's like an NFT-based game. Uh, not the Punk Doe, because that one is unavailable. I can't even get access to that game because it's sold out. Um, but there was another one, like some like star fighting game or something. So maybe I'll play that. Or maybe we'll make art. I don't know. But I'll see you all tomorrow night. We'll have fun again. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful um, rest of your week. Stay cool. Be cool.